Um, so today, um, I want to talk to you about uh, how to connect large uh, fleet of uh, battery power device, mainly Zephyr based. Um, so first, I would like to give you an overview of what is co and discussing a bit uh, some pieces of the protocol that have been misunderstood, misunderstood or that can be a bit um, tricky to, to, to get right. And also, yeah, uh, more feedback of all the deployment I did in the past because I work on cellular system and on more um, uh, home automation system uh, recently. And um, the way it works is a bit different. The way you implement the protocol and the trade-off you need to do are a bit uh, different. So I think it's interesting to talk about that. And yeah, and how you can use an open source solution to, to build that. Um, good. So first, yeah, um, a quick quick introduction to Coop. So Coop was created, I don't know, um, ten years, yeah, a bit more than ten years ago, uh, or maybe fourteen years ago. So it it, it was uh, created for working with low power constrained networks, and um, because of that, it's um, it's an interesting protocol because since they are targeting the very specific uh, system um, for smart energy, energy or automation with a uh, low power uh, device and constrained networks, they did something a bit strange, I would say. It's not usual. Um, we are used to a protocol where you have clear distinction between the reliability layer, for example, you use TCP uh, on top of um, IP, for example, and then you have an application protocol on top of that. Here, for perhaps, they combine the two together, so the reliability layer and also the more application request response uh, uh, part of the, of the protocol. So it's, a, it's quite a compact protocol. You can use it on UDP, but, and it's really done for a low power system. I will show you that later. But, um, the, but you can use it on something else, like UDP, you can use it on SMS, for example. I see people using it on top of serial line or, uh, or even NFC. Um, so it's, it's not a generalist protocol, it's a protocol for a specific uh, problem, which is wireless loss networks. But you can adapt it to do whatever you want if you, if you want. It's not going to be very optimal, optimal but it works. Um, okay, um, so the way it's encoded, it's, a, it's binary and um, you are, it's very compact, uh, but and it's mixing the application part and the reliability part. Um, I will show you that with an example. Um, so I have a small uh, ESP32 running the FM. And the co-op and the co-op uh, implementation of Zephyr here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so connecting to my, uh, my device. The Wi-Fi. Okay, I need to wait for the device to, to be connected. So the device here is going to be the co-op server. Um, so it's going to expose the resources that I will be able to use on my PC, which is going to be the co-op client. A bit like a, a HTTP server and an HTTP client. So, for example, um, okay, I'm going to start. to type the right port. Um, okay. So on my machine, I'm going to use a co-op client for 
getting uh, to getting a resource. So it's you use it a bit like HTTP. You want to get a value. I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, so it doesn't exist. I get a 400 error. Uh, or uh, if I give a, uh, a real URL, uh, no, is that the typo? Um, yeah, I get a response. Uh, so uh, quickly, uh, without going too much into the details, um, and explain why uh, Coop can be confusing because it's it's combining the reliability layer and the request response scheme in the same uh, packets. So. For example, when I did the, the first uh, get uh, from the client, so I issue a get with this message ID, so 43634, and I have a token. So you have two identifiers. You have one, the message ID, and one which is a token. And you get a response with an error code, but with the same message ID and the same token. So the token is used to correlate the request and the response at the at the rest level, so the get, the get and the and the, and the response, and the message ID is for reliability. Basically, the first message is a confirmable message, so it's expecting a hack for the same message ID, and you can see on the second one, uh, I'm issuing a get. But the server is going to behave differently. It's going to, to, to first acknowledge the, pack, the request to say, I received your message. You don't need to retransmit it. And then later, send, uh, send the content back, asking also uh, a confirmation, an acknowledgement from the, from the server. So in place of doing the transaction in two packets, here it's done in four packets. So yeah, it's due to the, to the fact that you can decide how you want to handle the reliability of your, um, of your message. Uh, if you want to take some time before building the, the response. <coughs> and yeah, and um, that's why a bit I find the co-op a bit confusing. Um, yes, and then yeah, you you find uh, exactly uh, what you can find uh, with uh, HTTP. So you can get um, URI, uh, you receive response code, you have methods. So <coughs> the go the goal of Coop here is really to replace two protocol in one, so TCP and HTTP, and something compact and fitting low power networks and constraint devices. So that's why I say it's not a, uh, a general purpose protocol like, um, I don't know, HTTP or, <coughs> or MQTT. The goal of co-op is really to, to target this kind of devices and application. Um, another feature is uh, blockwise transfer. So since you are using UDP, if your packet is larger than a UDP packet or the capability of the device, for example, if your device don't have a lot of memory, you don't want to send a one kilobyte payload, maybe you want to send a 200 or 500 payload. What Coop is doing, uh, which is a bit different of what TCP is doing, it's, do, it's having a very simple approach to blockwise transfer. So you send a first, uh, for example, a first get for downloading uh, something on the device. The device will send you back the first block and say, okay, this is the first block of and blocks, I have 20 more blocks to send to you. So then the client is going to iterate, iterate, ask the next block, get uh, uh, the block, et cetera, et cetera. So what is um, the main benefit? It's very simple, it's very simple to implement. Um, the main drawback is as soon as you want to, to send megabytes, it's going to be uh, very slow, especially if you have um, uh, high latency. For example, if you have alpha seconds latency, which is common on this kind of network, every block we need a round trip of uh, alpha second. And so if you need to, to move uh, one megabyte, it's going to take a long time, which is different of what TCP is doing because TCP has this concept of ACK windows, which is slowly opening, sending more and more packets in flight in parallel. Uh, and optimizing a bit the bandwidth. So it's something to take, um, 
to take care with co-op. If you want to transfer a lot of data, you need to be careful. It's going to take more time than TCP, for example. Um, quickly on, on the security, um, yeah, uh, it's basically you need to use a DTLS. Uh, you have another solution, which is OSCore, but OSCore is not very popular. I will say there is not a lot of open source implementation. Um, the main benefit of DTLS is that it's going, you need to do this uncheck, which is going, of course, to cost you time and, and, um, and bandwidth. Uh, but you have a nice protection against uh, denial of service. Uh, but also you can, you can support multiple cipher suites and you are able to negotiate with the device um, different way to, 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 um, to, uh, to secure it. So you can have a system that is basically going to evolve from one cipher suite to another cipher suite later if you have a security issue. Um, now, uh, now the, the quite ugly part of uh, using a UDP protocol when you want to, to do something a bit more complicated than what I did. So what I did here is you have the co-op server exposing the resources, the device, and you have um, the client, which is going to issue requests to, 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 the, to, the, to the device. When you want to start connecting this system to the cloud and not just interacting locally with maybe the device in the, connected to the, lo the local network, it will take some, um, the, the, div the device to stop acting only as a server, but also acting as a client, sending, for example, a post to the server to send, I don't know, telemetry data or something. So when you do that, um, and in the middle of your, um, of your internet connection, you have a router on, uh, which, is, which is going to translate the public IP of the network into the private IP of your local network. It's going to put a station for the server to be able to send back packets back to the client. So the client sends a message, the server sends back a, uh, a response. But if the server wants to send back a request to the client, it needs to do it in some given amount of time before the station is gone. And what is tricky is for TCP, most of the, the router you have in the wild, they keep station for more than 50 minutes. It's more uh, hours than minutes. For UDP, because UDP is mostly used for DNS and voice over IP or um, conferences software or this kind of application, the, the timeout is very low. It's like three minutes normally and sometimes as bad as 30 seconds. So you have basically when a device send a message to you, then you have a window of 30 seconds to send back requests and interacting with the device. And after 30 seconds, the device is not reachable. You need to wait for the device to come back. So, um, so it's where it's blurring the line with, uh, with HTTP um, and this concept of co-op server and co-op uh, client. Typically, when you want to connect this kind of devices to the cloud, you need to have the device acting as a co-op client, posting some values to the server uh, and doing it regularly if you want to maintain a connection. Maybe you don't want to maintain a connection, it's not a problem. Maybe you will pull the server once a day or something like that, which would be fine for a smart metering uh, application. Um, but if you want to maintain a connection, yeah, you need to, to send a packet regularly. Um, and then, yeah, the div then the server is able to interact with the device, reading the resources on the device, rewriting resources on the device, for example, for reconfiguring the, the device or interacting with the device. Um, yes, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so it's a tricky uh, problem. So for example, for home automation style uh, application, um, since you don't really uh, control the network, um, you don't really control what kind of internet service provider the, the end user is going to use, what kind of Wi-Fi router. Maybe they pile up uh, two Wi-Fi router. 
you can imagine all the all the complexity of that. So you need to use either uh, keep alive, so having the device pushing data all the time to keep the device, uh, the server, um, and, the, and the device uh, connected and be able to send back packets to the device. Typically, with um, this kind of application, for example, if you have a, uh, um, a phone application connected to the server and you want to interact in real time with the device, you have no choice. You, you need to, to keep uh, the connection open. Or if you don't have the needs for um, this kind of uh, interaction, you can buffer the operation of the cloud and wait for the next polling from the device. So that's one no network topology where co-op is used. Um, so it's not a problem. It, it's, it's not a problem. It, it's, it works to do this for this kind of low power network like six low pan on, or um, matter thread. Uh, because it's a local area network, um, you refresh the, always the connection in a way every three seconds. So it, it's not going to add a lot of uh, battery usage on your device. Uh, but for a cellular based application where you use a 4G uh, low power modem, for example, uh, it's a bit complicated because every packet costs you a lot. Uh, so it's, it's not practical, practical to send a message every uh, 30 seconds. But you can use different solutions. So either yeah, you use uh, some queuing system and you say my device is just going to pull from time to time and I'm not going to maintain a connection. You can maybe try to use uh, the good old uh, SMS uh, for forcing the device to reconnect when you want to interact with the device. Uh, it's a bit tricky to secure, but it works. Uh, or uh, you can ask your connectivity provider, your mobile network operator, or the people who's, who are selling you a SIM card to create a private network for you. So it's a software defined network you build on, they build on top of the public network. And it's in this private network, you will be able to um, select your IP address uh, and uh, remove totally the NAT from the, from the picture. So you will not have any more the problem of the NAT timeout. You can also try to use TCP based system. Uh, if you can handle the performance issue which come with using TCP on this kind of lossy network. Uh, yeah, and yeah, obviously the right solution would be IPv6 in both cases, but yeah, we are not there yet. Um, okay, yeah, one word about uh, lightweight M2M. So lightweight M2M is um, is a device management standard built on top of Coop. So on top of Coop, you have you have Coop this REST uh, interaction between a client and the, and the server sending guest, get, put, post, and, and being able to do um, modification or downloading content. So on top of that, uh, they build a device management system where you can uh, keep alive the device connected using what they call registration, provision the device, and also a REST model for uh, management objects, which are standardized. You have a very specific uh, object for describing the device. You need to populate your device data in the device object, and then it's going to be interoper interoperable. Um, I can maybe quickly show you how it's look in practice. Okay, I'm connected. Oh, is it working? Okay, so this is um, open source. Uh, uh, lightweight M2M server. So you can see you have devices registering with the server. And then when you look at the device, you have URL on the device for different uh, objects. And the objects are standardized. For example, the, the device, uh, standard, the device uh, object is looking like that. Uh, you have uh, all the information you need to populate if you want to conform with the standard. For connectivity monitoring, it's a bit the same. 
you do a read. So as you can see, the read is very slow, well, very slow. It's taking two seconds because this is an NB-IoT device. Oh, it's gone. Uh, let me check. Yeah, no, it's back. Yeah, you can see the read. It's taking quite a lot of time. It's the time for uh, NB-IoT uh, network to send a packet, then get back the response. So it's not bad. You are in good coverage, but it can be worse than that. Um, okay, so... Okay, now um, a bit of feedback from deploying this kind of t technology at scale. Uh, first, when you really want to use co-op. So using co-op on a Zephyr device is very easy because you have everything ready in the, in the project. You have a co-op client, a co-op server. Even like with M2M, you have everything ready. Uh, but then uh, you don't want to use in every case you want to use it when you have a constrained network. Uh, when I say constrained network is something like um, cellular and BIOT, thread matter, where you have high latency, sometimes high packet loss, uh, or uh, if you want to have uh, some kind of reliability on cellular network where the, uh, when, you are, when you are in fringe coverage in bad condition. For example, LTEM, which is a low, another low power uh, 4G, works well with TCP, but as soon as you are far uh, of the cellular tower and you are in bad condition, TCP is not working anymore, but co-op can work. So that's one of the benefits of, of co-op. Um, when you want to use um, lightweight M2M, so lightweight M2M, as I show you, you need to fit into the standard. So it's always a bit uh, complicated. So um, you probably want to use that if you have a need for interoperability, if you want to, your device to be able to be managed by different vendors uh, which are supporting the standard, or simply if you need the standard compliance. For example, uh, uh, most of the cellular devices um, they have a lightweight M2M client because it's used by the, by the mobile network operator to be able to monitor and reconfigure some capabilities of the device. Uh, or if you have a strong security requirements, that could be interesting to reuse lightweight M2M because they have everything ready in to provision, uh, certificate, uh, bootstrap the device, uh, put in place key rotation, uh, provisioning uh, certificate on small devices is always a bit complicated. Or, for example, if you need to connect to multiple servers and manage uh, access control list between the different servers, that would be interesting to, to reuse lightweight M2M. But you need to fit in the standard, and it's sometimes a bit complicated, uh, especially with battery powered device, uh, low power devices. I work with, um, with a customer which built a, a very constrained system, a, a tracker, uh, a package tracker. And the system was really just a, an antenna, a chipset, and a battery, a small battery. And the system was designed to just last the time of the parcel to, to, to go to its destination. They started to use lightweight M2M, but lightweight M2M was not exactly uh, fitting their needs because they, in lightweight M2M, you need to have to send a packet for register the device, send a packet for um, for sending the telemetry data. So it's two packets. So it was consuming more uh, battery than creating something ad hoc with co-op and packaging the two together. So they first started with lightweight M2M, and then finally they made the trade-off to give up on the interoperability and move to um, to something uh, uh, proprietary to save some battery. So, yeah, it's nice to have interoperability, but for low power devices, it can be a huge constraint. Um, another um, 
Another thing that is interesting with, um, with co-op is you are able to do firmware update with um, very constrained devices on this kind of uh, constrained networks. Uh, but you need to be a bit careful. You cannot just try to send uh, your firmware image from the server to the device uh, because the connection is not great. Um, if the device reboot or the connection break, you will not be able to resume. So maybe you will start from the beginning, draining more and more battery for the device. So what you probably want to do is to first send a URL to the device and let the device download the firmware. When, for example, the device is having battery or the user is not using the, 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 the device and let the device deal with it, start downloading, resume if needed, um, so you can really optimize your system. Another interesting question with um, the deployment of these, those devices, uh, those low power devices at scale, is that you often, it depends on the business model you have, but for example, if you are building uh, cheap hardware, you sell the hardware, and you don't have a very strong revenues from uh, subscription from the end user. Uh, it's difficult to build your system with um, software as a service that are costing you every month. Uh, but also maybe it's also expensive to do it everything yourself. But at the end, since it's a low power device, um, you will need to optimize a lot of um, elements, but also the, um, the first firmware you will ship will always have some bugs, especially bugs at the lowest level of the communication. And even if you can release a new firmware, the factory, the warehouse that will still uh, contain those old firmware with all those old bugs, and you are basically uh, forced to support those bugs for the lifetime of the device, so it could be 10 years. So it could be a bit complicated to do that with, um, with, um, with proprietary system. Uh, it's, it, open source gives you a lot of more control on, typically on the server side. Maybe you have one version of the device which behaves strangely. You have a workaround for that, and you will keep the workaround until the, the device is, is not supported anymore. So that's why it's interesting to, to look at open source solution, because you can always fork uh, and maintain your own workaround for managing your mistake from the past, in place of trying to force your software vendor to, to do it for you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, to, um, to start uh, using co-op. So on Zephyr, it's very simple because you have a co-op client, a co-op server sample. Uh, you have also a lightweight M2M client uh, in Zephyr, which are good qualities, are working uh, out of the box. It's not very simple to understand how to use the co-op client and server with DTLS for securing the communication and also how to use the co-op uh, stack in the client plus server mode, like the device posting element, but also receiving a request from the server. But the lightweight, M the lightweight M2M client is doing that. So if you are looking, for example, look in the lightweight M2M client. Um, one other interesting constraint, if you want to create a, a, a matter uh, device and you are targeting um, a certification, you probably want to use uh, whatever uh, thread implementation is provided by your silicon vendor. So most of the time it's open thread. Uh, open thread is containing um, a co-op client. So you probably want to use this one and not use in parallel of the co-op uh, client, the other co-op client, which is in Zephyr. Um, and yeah, and of course they have different APIs, so they are not very easy to, to switch over. Um, yeah, and if you are not using um, uh, Zephyr, uh, if you are using Linux, for example, 
uh, Lib Coop is, is pretty good. It's probably one of the most complete Coop implementation. On the server, um, you have basically two options. Either you use Java, and in Java you have um, Eclipse California, uh, Open Coop, uh, which, which is a bit more recent, I would say, or modern, a bit easier to understand. Eclipse California is probably old. It's older, but it's more battle-tested, and yeah, and it's, uh, it's uh, a bit more well-known. And uh, yeah, for if you want to use light, lightweight and M2M, you can start with um, Eclipse Session, which is um, pretty complete from a lightweight and 2 m point of view. Or you use Go. Go, they have a nice uh, uh, co-op uh, library with a DTS implementation. Uh, all those libraries are working very well at large scale, so are deployed by um, vendors at large scale. Um, but outside of Java and Go, you don't have a lot of options. The other libraries are not very great or they don't really exist. Uh, that's good. Um, that's it for me. Uh, just to say that Tado is hiring in EU if you are interested. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and we have time for questions, if there is questions. So I was wondering, uh, one of the parts of the presentation that in interests me the most is the how to get to the, the to the client from the server. And you mentioned a few uh, strategies. SMS uh, was yeah. one of them, which surprised me quite a bit. Uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, you know, what in, in constrained environments like that, the, and the two constrained environments that you define, which is battery-powered device, but in the home, yeah. and battery de battery device, but connected via cellular, uh, so mm -hmm. NB-IoT or LTEM. Uh, what's the uh, you know, uh, uh, as per your understanding, the most common approach to use to get, for example, in the firmware update diagram that you had, yeah. you had the initial push yeah. from the server to the client of the URL, right? Uh, that needs to happen, uh, so that, that needs to go through the NAT, right? Yeah. So how, how, what, what, what's the most, most common approach? The most common approach is to do that is to have the, the device pulling the server to, to say, hey, I'm here. And then once you have the device connected, then you can do sending the firmware update. Okay. So 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 not not going beyond the, the, the threshold of the 30 yeah. second threshold or whatever. Yeah. Okay. In practice you never connect connect to a device from a, an IP address or over the internet, maybe locally on the on the, um, on the local network, but from the cloud to the device, you never right. try to reach an IP address. You need to wait for the device to connect. Maybe the, the device will keep the connection for weeks open for you. And then, yeah, you can send a okay. message, so firmware update. So then on the server side, basically you have, uh, say, a firmware update, you have it queued, and as the next time the device connects, that's when you do the post yeah. to the device. Okay, yeah. good, thanks. And uh, <clears throat> do you have experience with uh, Eclipse Lashan in production environment and production deployments? Uh, yeah. yeah, I basically I founded the, the, Eclipse proje the Eclipse Lashan project and I use uh, Eclipse Lashan for large scale deployment. How large? Millions. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, even if it's not out of the box, it's basically my job to help people to scale uh, this kind of open source solution. Because for example, Lation, it's coming with a nice sandbox demo you have. Well, it's what I showed you. But if you, it's working on single node, if you want to make that running on multiple nodes at scale with security, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, but you, you can do it. The base lightweight like, 2 m implementation is scalable. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you have much experience with um, like access control and author authorization from clients accessing, so for example, 
like a client, specific clients only being able to access certain um, firmware binaries or things like that, if you had experience doing that? Yeah, very small one, like for lightweight M2M, you can have a device connecting to registering, so doing this kind of, of dense refreshing to two servers. For example, one was just uh, in charge of managing the firmware update. So in the device, it's configured that this firmware update object uh, resource is only accessible by this server. And the rest of the resources, so like the sensor and everything was uh, configured to, to be managed by a second server. That means that you need to connect to two servers. You need to maintain two co-op two co context, two DTLS con context, so it's quite costly on the, on, the, on the device, but it works. It's a bit tricky. Uh, the, the standard is not very clear about uh, how to do it, uh, but yeah, you, c you, you can do it. Thank you.